How do we make memories? Everyone does it all the time, but few understand what's involved at the level of neuroscience. And in aging societies with both Alzheimer's and dementia on the rise, figuring out the actual mechanisms involved was breakthrough science, worthy of one of the world's richest science prizes. Graham Collingridge and two colleagues did just that, and were recently awarded the Greta Lundbeck European Brain Research Prize, or the Brain Prize, as it's called. He is the first Canadian-based researcher to win this prestigious prize, and he joins us now for more. Graham Collingridge, Chair of the Department of Physiology at the University of Toronto and a senior investigator at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital, and we are delighted to welcome you here for your first television interview to our studio. Nice Thank to have you. you here. How'd you get the news that you won the Brain Prize? <clears throat> I received an email from the Secretariat of the Society saying that the chairman wanted to talk to me urgently on the phone, and it had to be a phone call. That usually indicates bad news. It often means <laughs> it's some work, but on this occasion it was good news. Good news. So you made the phone call, and? I was surprised, of course, completely surprised that I received this, this, this wonderful prize. What was your reaction excited. when they told you? Yeah, deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> deep breath. Tell us about it. I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and think that a lot of people have not heard of, quote unquote, the Brain Prize right. before. So what is it? Okay, so it's a, a prize awarded every year. It's been running now for six years, uh, and it's awarded to one or more. It's usually a team of two or three scientists who are working in the area of brain research. Uh, it has a heavy European element because it's awarded by the... Lundbeck Foundation out of Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, but the recipients, whilst would have a European connection, could come from anywhere around the world. Graham, I hear it's a lot of money. It's, uh, yes, it's a reasonable sum of money, yes. <laughs> you, you want to say it or should I say it? <laughs> uh, you're gonna it's a say million it. euros. Yeah, it's a lot of money. A yeah. million euros, yeah. which you share with your colleagues, yes. of course. Yeah. But your chunk of a million euros works out to, I think it's half a million Canadian dollars or something. Approximately, yes. Approximately a half a million Canadian yeah. dollars is not bad. Yeah, no, of course. You know what it's you fantastic. want to do with the money? I'm afraid it's going to have to go towards a mortgage to buy a property in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Because I've know. just moved to this city, as you know. What do you think? Toronto? Mm. Fantastic. Absolutely wonderful city. Yeah. Really, really enjoying it here. With that accent, uh, you know... Yeah. It's a little bit off for Toronto, you know. Yeah, well, I come from London. The London. You don't say. <laughs> the <laughs> London, other one. UK. Has your life changed much since you got the news? Um, yes, it has because uh, I've been constantly interviewed by the press. <laughs> <laughs> and are you enjoying that? Yeah, no, it, 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 I enjoy it. Um, but I have a real. Uh, I have another job I have to do as well. So um, you have a real job. Actually. I have a, a real job. This is very interesting. It's very important. I enjoy doing it. My other job doesn't go away, too. Understood. Well, let's talk about that other job. Okay. What uh, are the series of discoveries that you made that led to your winning this award? Okay. So just to go back one step before my involvement, um, there was a very famous Canadian psychologist, Donald Hebb, who worked at McGill, who postulated that memories would be stored at the connections between nerve cells, the synapses, in response to activity of both the neurons. So if two neurons were firing together, they would wire together. The connections would become stronger. And that was believed or postulated to be the way in which our brains store information, how we learn and remember things. And uh, one of my colleagues, the co-recipient of the prize, Tim Bliss, was a student at McGill, not formally with Donald Hebb, but influenced by Donald Hebb's hypotheses, and went in search of the Hebbian synapse, as it is now known. Mm. And he discovered the process known as long-term potentiation, which is a way of studying those same molecular mechanisms that we use when we're learning information, but in an experimental system. And long-term potentiation has now become extremely widely studied around the world as the prominent model of learning and memory. My involvement started when I was a postdoc scientist at Van in Vancouver. How uh, many years ago was that? That was quite a long time ago. <laughs> Longer than I can remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, this was back in the early 1980s. Okay. I was at UBC uh, working in the laboratory of a great uh, Canadian physiologist by the name of Hugh McLennan. And in his lab, working with a, another a young PhD student, Stephen Kale, between us, we identified the trigger mechanism for this process of long term potentiation. Mm -hmm. We identified a particular molecule, which is known as the N methyl diaspartate, or NMDA receptor, as the trigger for long term potentiation. And then a few years later, 
the third recipient of the Brain Prize, Richard Morris, showed that that same receptor was important for learning and memory, as would be predicted by the, the discovery of its role in long-term potentiation. So you have been at this for three and a half decades. I have been at it for three and a half decades. Tim Bliss started his work back in 1966. Oh my goodness. So it's been a long time. Half a century fruition. for him. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Have there, okay, so you, you, your discoveries came building on the work of others previously. Absolutely. Have, have others uh, built on your work to make other discoveries subsequently? Absolutely. So now there are hundreds of neuroscientists around the world working on long-term potentiation. So we know much, much more about the process now than, of course, we did when, when I started. What we discovered way back then was the role of the NMDA receptor in this process. Mm -hmm. Through the work of our lab and many other labs around the world, we now know that this receptor is central for understanding brain plasticity, so the mechanisms of learning and memory. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to have optimal activation of the NMDA receptor. Too much activation is bad. Too little activation is bad. And it's increasingly apparent that many of the major brain disorders are due to alterations in these plasticity mm. mechanisms. Is there anything you can point to there that might help us understand what you're up to? Yeah, so... That's a pretty fancy background. That's here. a really beautiful picture, mm -hmm. actually. So that's a schematic of a neuron, the brain cell, of mm -hmm. which we have billions in our brains. And there are connections between those nerve cells called mm -hmm. synapses, of which we have trillions. And it's at those synapses where memories are stored. It's the connections between the nerve cells, as postulated by Donald Hebb. Hmm. And it's the NMDA receptor, which is the trigger for the process to start. It's the equivalent of the learning of the process. Too much NMDA receptor activation, though, can lead to neurodegeneration. Too little NMDA receptor activation can lead to learning and memory deficits. And it seems that these may be causally related to conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, autism and depression and chronic pain. Hmm. So if we can understand these processes in more detail than we currently do now, then in principle, we and, you know, when I say we, the neuroscience community, hmm. can translate these discoveries into better treatments and hopefully eventually cures for some of the world's worst diseases. Chi Van Dang, whom I'm sure you know, cancer researcher at the uh, Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia. He was on our program not too long ago. Mm -hmm. I wanna play a little clip of that and we'll pick up on okay. that. This is what he had to say about the way in which scientific research is conducted. Show the clip, please. Competition has been very healthy. I think competition has already generated vast amount of information that Jim alluded to. And every time we reveal something new, we don't understand something else. But I think we've gotten to the point, and I think that most of us will agree, that after the Cancer Genome Atlas, as well as many other things that have been done, uh, it, with new drugs, immunotherapy, that we've gotten to a crossroads where I think collaboration is going to break the barriers much faster than working on, uh, on things alone. That's what I want to pick up on. Okay. Do you think there's enough co a collaboration going on in your world to make the breakthroughs that the rest of the world, of course, hopes for? Yeah. I think certainly the amount of collaboration in our area is increasing all the time. People recognize that they cannot just make breakthroughs on their own. The, the technologies are developing all the time, and to make important advances in the understanding requires applying lots of different technologies in so-called multidisciplinary research. And most individuals, certainly myself, are, don't have the qualifications to do everything. So we tend to collaborate. So increasingly, that is happening. We also hear, though, that there's a hell of a lot of competition among the different institutions as well, which yeah. could inhibit collaboration. Yeah, there's competition between individuals and between institutions, and that's driven largely by the need to obtain funding, hmm. and funding is very competitive. Yeah. There's not enough money to go around and support all the great science. Hmm. That could possibly be done. Have the three of you ever worked together? We've worked together a little bit in terms of experimental research, but not very much. Hmm. We've done a lot together in terms of writing review articles where we've given an overview of the field and we've organized meetings together um, we've collaborated in, in in those areas there's a lot of concern in Canada right now that we don't do enough to fund early career scientists yeah were you all in that stage when you made those discoveries I was certainly an early career scientist mm -hmm. I was a young postdoc I'd just come through the UK system where you obtain a PhD very quickly so I was actually quite young as a postdoc in Canada um, and after two years as a postdoc, I then moved on to a second position in Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. and then was able to obtain a faculty position at what would now be considered a very young age. 
but there was far less competition then. Hmm. I mean, what has happened is groups such as myself have trained people. They've gone and started their own labs. They've trained people who've gone and started their own labs. So there's been a mushrooming of, of the production of more and more really well-qualified scientists. Hmm. One of the things you may come to realize now that you're in Toronto is that Canadians, as much as they love the place, have a bit of an inferiority complex about this place because we're next door to the biggest, mm -hmm. the biggest everything in the world. Yeah. So this question, you know, would sound odd coming out of an American or out of a Brit, but not odd coming out of a Canadian. Why do you want to come to Toronto? Oh, Toronto is, is a very unique place. So it has one of the world's greatest universities. I mean, the University of Toronto is consistently ranked in the top 20 universities in the world by any measure. Mm. It also has fantastic hospitals with these research institutes, such as the Lundefeld Tannenbaum, where I work, and met, met many other examples too. Mm. Uh, and they all work in collaboration. So all the researchers within these research institutes within hospitals have affiliations in the university. And this brings a unique opportunity for collaboration between basic scientists such as myself, and clinical scientists and other basic scientists embedded within research institutes in the hospital. You say unique set of circumstances. It's pretty unique. I mean, it, you, you get collaboration between universities and hospital-based research centers anywhere. Right. But it doesn't, I've not seen it work to the same degree that it works well here. So within downtown Toronto, there's the university, Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute is five minutes walk away. Sick Kids is another five minutes walk away. Mm -hmm. The other research centers are all centrally based. It's very easy for collaboration and interactions. But again, this Canadian modesty coming to the fore here, my hunch is five or 10 years ago, you probably didn't know that that existed. I didn't. Right. Uh, so uh, the notion that we have all of this infrastructure yeah. to assist that which you are doing yeah. is probably not very well known around the world, is it? I, I think it could be better promoted, absolutely. Huh. I mean, the infrastructure is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I've been blown away by how good it is. So what do we do about that? Get the word out that we're... Oh, we have to get the word out. Uh, how do you do that? <sighs> More TV interviews. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're preaching to the converted here. <laughs> you're on television in Ontario. Um, how about for young people who want to get into neuroscience? Yep. What's the advice to them? Uh, well, I, if you're passionate about it, definitely do it. I mean, it's an incredibly interesting subject. I mean, it explains who we are. Um, the best way to do it is to do an undergraduate degree in a neuroscience or neuroscience related discipline. So for example, I'm chair of the Department of Physiology. Many of the physiologists will study a significant amount of neuroscience. There are other subjects as well. And then if you find that you really enjoy it, the next stage will be a master's or a PhD. How did you get into it originally? I applied uh, at the University of Bristol in the UK to study pharmacology, which is building upon biology and chemistry. And it happened that most of the lecturers, uh, the assistant professors, uh, as they will be called here, were interested in brain sciences. Hmm. So I learned about brain sciences. I became completely fascinated by it. And I decided this is the subject I want to work on. Interesting. So you had no intention of going into it in the first place? Not until I was an undergraduate and realized how interesting it was. If you're a young person, if you're a student who you think who potentially has an interest in this, is it easy to access this? We, we can't accommodate everybody who wants to do neuroscience here. I wish we could, hmm. but it's so popular. I mean, I, I have emails every day of people wanting to work in a lab. Hmm. I wish I could accommodate them all, but unfortunately I can't. When I interview neuroscientists, I always like to put things in perspective. Yeah. For example, on a scale of one to 10, one means we don't know hardly anything about the brain. 10 means we know absolutely everything about the brain. Yeah. Where are we? That's very hard to answer that. I would guess around about three or four. That's what they all say. They yeah. all say about three or four. Really? Exactly right. Wow. Isn't that something? And yeah. with all you know, you're not even halfway to there to understanding yeah, the brain. No, no, no. I mean, if we could understand the brain in its entirety, we would have cures now for Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia, et cetera, et cetera. Amazing. But we know a lot more than we did 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's all amazing stuff. Graham Collingridge, it's really good of you to visit us here at TVO. Congratulations on the Brain Prize and best of luck with your work. Thank you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.